I'm so glad to be here. And I am glad to be able to present work that has come out of, of my long engagement with Durkheim. Is your mic? I don't feel That's not mic. being you. That, that's, okay. that's not right. the Okay. All right. Um, my <coughs> long engagement is different from most people's, including my students, in that I translated, retranslated the elementary forms of religious life, which means that I had to read every single word and think about it. And I can guarantee you that is a very different experience from reading the excerpts that, <laughs> that I read as an undergraduate and gave people. And so, and I had many encounters and many nights while working on that project. This is it, by the way, and don't buy the newest one, which is terrible if you're going to get one. Uh, many nights I looked forward, I wished to, it was possible to have a seance with him, to summon his spirit somehow, because there were resonances in it that uh, people didn't hear, and they were coming through to me loud and clear. In particular, the relevance of the elementary forms of religious life to trying to understand the phenomena of race. I said it in, or as that we call the United States phenomena of race, I hope from now on very soon people will be saying race craft. But we, um, uh, I said that, I made that point in a paper at Oxford and I got icy stares of anthropologists who supposedly understand the book. And so I guess maybe some, that meant I was doing something good, or maybe it meant <laughs> <laughs> simply that they, had not really read every word of elementary forms of religious life. Especially, that this is to, to forecast some of what I'm going to read, especially there's a chapter that I know people don't read, and that is the uh, chapter that is my subject today, the idea of soul. It's astonishing, because remember Durkheim was a disciple and an advocate of science positive, science modeled on the natural sciences. And I can tell you from reading every bit of it that he managed to talk about soul in a way that did not divert, uh, diverge from the canons of natural science. I've published, I have written a paper of that, whose argument is entirely that. It is an amazing performance. And I think one reason for it, which came to be in one of my seances, is that he was thinking, too, he too was thinking hard about what race meant in his own time and place. Late 19th century France. Am I frustrating you? No. Okay. <laughs> um, late 19th century France was a place that boiled with, um, with social conflict. And by the end of the, by the middle of the 1880s, there was a, a, an anti-Semitic current in France that, changed, that moved from the old religious formulation to an explicitly racial one, racist one, where there's a distinction drawn sharply between Aryan and Semite, and it's in a, an 1886 book called Jewish France, La France Juive, by somebody named um, Edouard Drummond. I tried to read his book. I did read as much as I could, but on the page, he is the exact equivalent of one of those Fox people who, whose mouths go on like murder, like that, a, a spewing forth of nastiness about Jews, about Freemasons, uh, and he, it was an instant bestseller. It, told, it sold 100,000 copies in a year. Durkheim and his people obviously were concerned about it. They noticed it. They noticed milder variants of the same thing 
and uh, people who said we have to pull France together, the nationalism, la Nationalité was also an issue. Who's French and who's not? Which carries you back in that direction. And then everybody is aware that in 1894 came the Dreyfus Affair, which shook France for 12 years. Durkheim got very interested in it, committed to it, and so were many of his colleagues. And I said, how could somebody who's doing that in the middle of the 1890s say, um, well, the only, he says he got inspiration from the work of Robertson Smith, The Religion of the Semites. But I can't imagine, he said, that's the only inspiration I had for studying religion. But what I can say for sure is that the inspiration came in the middle of the 1890s when the Dreyfus affair, affair exploded. Now, one more thing, I, I, can't, I can't go, I, I'm excited, I'm charged up, I can't go with the, the text I gave. I, wanted, I want you all to see this because I think you all have the opportunity to read this and commune with this person uh, in some way. And I want to tell you something more, they're not degrees of truth, but I'm tempted to say more true than people will tell you who read it and lecture on it in their sleep, have not engaged with it deeply enough to imagine who the person is. Um, uh, does everybody know the concept of effervescence collective? Collective effervescence, where there's a scene in Book 2, Chapter 7, where there's frenzy and people are celebrating their sacredness, their communion with each other, they're, uh, they are people who belong to a to, uh, a to the fratry of a of a, to, uh, a kind of totemic group, and they um, and I and it's in the dark and it's, it's violent. You can tell he uses the word frenzy. It's really I went to the ethnography. He really heightens it. I knew he was experiencing it off the page, and I said, I bet you anything, Emil Durkheim witnessed one of those anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish riots that happened in Alsace, where he came from. Knew how what they felt like, knew how they looked, and knew the work they were doing. But nobody would believe me. <laughs> oh, that's just a, that was just a suspicion. But then a Canadian named Marcel Fournier wrote a new biography of Durkheim, this fact. And in it, he has a quotation from Durkheim which says, I was 12 in 1870, and I saw the breaking of stores in my town, Epinal. I said, okay, so the one who came to me in my, my sense of what was on the page was true. And Marcel Fournier, with whom I now have a, a, an email correspondence, I met him last summer in Bordeaux, <coughs> too, he wrote me back to say that uh, there was a field of work, it was race science, such as was being done in the United States, um, where they did the measuring and they were figuring out who was, it, who was who. There was a taxonomy going on and then there was an establishment of hierarchies going on. And Durkheim and his people sniffed at it, they didn't like it a bit. And Marcel said, they called it de la raciologie. Raciology, and this, in, a, in a, a term of dismissal. That was going on. So I um, said, well, if this is so, then this study that is uh, built on this, um, the reports, uh, the ethnographies of totemic clans in Australia, is to be sure an analysis based on those accounts. But it is also a splendid projection of imagination to what, uh, to what existed in France and he was seeing created before his eyes. People at the effervescence collective could get into a state where everybody was an emu 
the creature of the clan, where everybody was a kangaroo and they would be uh, outside themselves, transformed. And Dark Tide died in 1917, but his nephew and co-worker, uh, Marcel Moss, lived to see the Nazis, and he said, now <coughs> we discovered how they were, how people were able in Germany to turn the population like spinning, children spinning tops. We saw that already, it's true. So I don't read it as an old tome of a classic. I read it as something that is still instructive to me. The central interest of it is that the, uh, his treatment of Totemic clans where you can't, where the relationship can't possibly be derived from nature, not from descent, not from physical appearance. It's all created in society. That part uh, he shows for the Totemic clans, and I am sure he's saying this is how humankind does it. And I know he's saying, this is, that is to say, anywhere you have human beings and you're creating collective identities, in Australia they're different but not hostile. In Europe they were different identities but on the verge of becoming hostile. You have the same mechanics at work. And he's the positive scientist, he's looking for things that work here and there. If uh, in the same way if you have the mechanics right. I said I can say that for sure because he's, Durkheim says it on the first page and I remember it. I noticed it because I had to read every word. <laughs> he says, um, Uh, society sets itself different problems from those of history or ethnography. It does not seek to become acquainted with bygone forms of civilization for the sole purpose of being acquainted with and reconstructing them. Instead, like any positive science, its purpose above all is to explain a present reality that is near to us and thus capable of affecting our ideas and actions. That reality is man. More especially, it is present day man. For there is none other that we have a greater interest in knowing well. Do you see what I see? Are you <laughs> see what I see? So there it is. If I'm coming now with a strange topic. Uh, today, with a strange topic, social, uh, the soul, um, the idea of soul, which is book two, chapter eight, and uh, uh, because I find that it, it has, there's a concept at the core of it that's compelling once you see it. That's the concept with which we're all familiar, the idea of soul. My sister Barbara and I deployed the, uh, the method of Durkheim by saying, um, you can observe soul that the, the, uh, as a property shared by a group of people only by watching that group of people enact soul. And book two, chapter eight is enacting soul. And so it goes from how somebody, how divination is done to know which ancestor is being born to um, passing on um, the identity of kangaroo by presenting him a physical representation of it and being told, this is the body of a kangaroo. You are a kangaroo. And um, you watch that and you, well, I watched that and I realized that everybody is told you are a what? Everybody learns in the course of growing up not only that they're an individual who, but they're also a collective what? And there it is done in, in exotic rituals 
But Barbara and I said, we're going after the rituals that don't look exotic to us, but probably would if somebody came from Australia to watch. Or we imagine people coming from Mars. We have, I, in the pages of the book, they often speak of, of somebody who comes from somewhere else, a child or a Martian. We have, we have um, adopted the idea of, of racecraft to replace two ideas that are <coughs> un, act, un, unsatisfactory as far as we're concerned. Um, one is race, and in general when it's used in the United States, it refers to the conception or the doctrine that nature produced humankind in distinct groups, each defined by inborn traits that its members share and that differentiate them from the members of other distinct groups of the same kind, but of unequal rank. A little comment, that one, does that more or less fit what one <coughs> thinks of as race in the United States? It's physical and uh, it's a group and the groups are uh, unequal. Which part of it is invisible and belongs to the realm of doing that creates soul in that definition? And I will answer immediately. It is hierarchy. That one has to be done. That one has to be acted out. If you ask somebody, what's, hot, what's superior, a yellow rose or a red one? What would, what would the rose be able to tell you if you looked at it? OK. That's where I'm going. That to now, if people, somebody decides to breed only red roses or only yellow roses, there's the action taken on that. But otherwise, nature won't present won't present hierarchy. That has to be done. That exists only in society. That Durkheim says that too, because human beings have hierarchy of various kinds in social life. They suppose nature has it too. Okay, there, there's that, um, and the problem I have with that is, is the uh, notion of race that um, seems to carry with it the idea of hierarchy instead of noticing how the hierarchy comes to be. Other part is uh, at, uh, and making, uh, and hierarchy is not made once and for all, it's repetitive has to be done. People forget, it will disappear. Just as people can forget their kangaroos, and thus their, their symbolic reminders and actions that keep you up to date. Okay, so we have a world where hierarchy is constantly made. So let's not continue the business of looking for racial traits when we should be looking for racial rights in the midst of everyday life in this country. And that's our main argument. And we don't see it any more than, I suppose, the Australian Klansmen see it. There's one of them, a kangaroo, who is trying to tell people, tell his ethnographers, uh, Baldwin Spencer and Francis Gillum, he's a member of the kangaroo clan, he capital K kangaroo, that's his name. And he says, uh, he's trying to explain to him to them, incredulous folks, that he and the kangaroo are the same. And they say, this is reported on the page of the, of the ethnography and, and Durkheim uh, conveys it. He says, um, so, so he grabs a picture they've recently taken of him and they, he says, look, this is what I mean, the same. And they still think, oh, isn't that charming, this, this primitive. But he is saying whatever soul says when people belong to the same something, the same race. Of course, they, they disregard the happenstances of nature. Oh, not everybody fits the norm. And 
so forth. Never mind. In the, uh, in the clan performances we see, what's missing empirically, you can fix. You paint it on, you dress up in it, and periodically you conduct rituals. Now, somebody will say, but later already gave us the dress to give races, but I'm going to beg the difference a little bit because it's not quite the same. And uh, a person from Mars would not probably, would be as incredulous as the ethnographers about what the kangaroo was saying. Am I losing anybody? You must stop me if I am. Yes. One, one thing you said, I think might be worth going back to, you said something about racial rights. And I think I heard you say R I T E S. That's what I'm saying. Definition of race by behavior. Yes. And I think, as I heard it rather than thought about it, I thought you might be saying R I G H. No. Which is a different concept altogether. Rituals. Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm glad you asked that. Okay. All right. We have, so we are, we're thinking of race with that kind of, uh, of consideration. <coughs> and so, we have, uh, so it goes with what we call racism, which is what everybody calls something racism. We are not talking about the, the dislike, the malevolence, the hatred, and all of that. We're talking about practice, race rights that are, uh, that apply a social, civic, or legal double standard based on ancestry and to the ideology surrounding it. So you get an illusion, don't you? People in the South, black people in the South were segregated because they're black. And look, the trait of skin color becomes the cause of the action, but that's not true, is it? It's the segregation of the, the streetcars uh, and buses in that, in that day may define the, the status of black in the South and subordinate. So racism is action. Who cares about thought? And in any case, any case people don't bother themselves. They have other things to do than be thinking about that. This, I'm talking about routine. Kinds of ritual that do a certain thing, they're habitual, they pass unnoticed. And if somebody uh, stops to say, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. How could dark skin cause segregation? Or cause the police shooting? Or cause the um, arrest, uh, the, the uh, arrest of somebody or the stopping stop and frisk somebody. How, it's not how the person looks. It's a practice that makes the look of that person into something. <laughs> it's something done. People may not even give it a second thought. And if they do, it's, uh, maybe they, they, they have to, I don't know. Okay, with those things said, I want to turn to soul. I said I was going to talk about Du Bois, but I just can't, there would be too much to say and talk about Durkheim too. So I'm leaving Du Bois mainly out, except to say that he did write a book called The Souls of Black Folk. <coughs> uh, and published it in 1903, <coughs> and he aimed it at, uh, and its purpose was to con convey the humanity of Afro-American and slaves <coughs> at a time when racist uh, treatment and racist definition was holding them down. Um, he said, uh, well, I won't quote him. Um, Suffice to say that racism, as we know, was, uh, I said it was rampant in France at the end of the 19th century. Well, the theories uh, uh, were transatlantic. They belonged to the Atlantic world, and the United States had plenty of them. And Du Bois had enough of it many times in his life. And this time, he just said, uh, 
he talked about it once and for all, I'm going to let people know that there is something other than this tertiary quid, this third <coughs> that exists somewhere between, he, he said, somewhere between men and cattle, God created a tertiary quid, called to the Negro, uh, and called to the Negro. He spent his time, uh, he spent his life uh, combating that and combating the rituals and combating the science so far as he could. Uh, at one point in the 20s, he, he, he gave up on it. He just said, look, this is the last thing I'm going to say about it. The race theories, you know, they're still doing measurement. They're pretending or trying to be pretending to do science. Um, he said, look, a black person is a person who must ride the Jim Crow car in Georgia. And he got out of the business of definition other than the ritual side of the of conduct in everyday, in everyday life. Um, uh, in one of the chapters of Racecraft, I imagine <coughs> Durkheim and Du Bois sitting down together in a conversation on these matters. Uh, it's the final chapter of, uh, of the book. Uh, it's there because I, I wanted to undermine, we both wanted to undermine by putting them together on this topic. You don't have to have different appearance to start with. You have to say that every few minutes to re if you're American to remind yourself that looking, dif but that, uh, looking different from other French people uh, exempted um, look, looking as white as other French people exempted uh, Durkheim from being subject to a racist ban. Okay, that it's, it doesn't, re once again, that, that thing that I defined as race, it's not something that sits in natural, it's act, uh, in nature, it's activated. Um, and I think it's, in America, it's uh, hardly possible to say that often enough. Because we forget it, we think he is. Well, wait a minute. There's something more complex than is. Um, the idea, um, well, I'll leave that point there. Um, in America, we, we have a, uh, somebody I mentioned, in, in also in race path, a, a great biologist called um, Agassiz, Louis Agassiz. And he was, a, he was a great expert, a great biologist, but he got to the United States and he, he got baptized into the racecraft church and joined the theory that, uh, the, that human evolution was not one line. You know, all of humanity came to have the same, arrived at the same time as Homo sapiens from the, from the hominids and the hominoids. Um, he joined on that and developed it, that the, there was, every race had its order and the Africans arrived last at the line from, from non-human <coughs> human. Now, if you go to Cambridge, Mass, where we were, weren't we on Agassiz Street? That's him. Right. And he was a, a great contributor to science, but he was doing that. It was, it was in the air, and he was doing that. Now to soul as an element, uh, an elemental form of religious life. By the time Durkheim started writing on religion, it had been well agreed that everywhere people found religion, they saw, found something, scholars in Europe found religion. They found people who had something like a concept of soul. 
And so there was a big debate about what, the, what could be its origin. And what is it for, after all? Soul is invisible. Nobody thinks it's visible. Nobody thinks it's material. It can materialize, but it's not fundamentally that. So, um, he said, well, we can explain it. And we can explain it because there are two functions it performs that are absolutely fundamental. It provides for, it makes it possible for us to think the continuity of individual personhood over time. We think that's obvious, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and we are able to think that thing I was just talking about, the continuity of groups of people remaining the same over time. It's enormous, and yet it's necessary for human life. People are living uh, with a group of people with whom they cooperate. They have a we to address themselves to. And the idea of soul uh, allows, uh, is, allows for thinking about it and the activation, the acting on soul allows people to take it in as real. It gets very difficult. I hope, stop me <coughs> if, if it's uh, unclear. Um, somehow, the, uh, the, the disparity, the, dis the separateness of individuals has to be overcome so, so that there is a uh, a community with continuity. And he shows, by looking at the rites, we see that people imagine this community from the beginning of time, from the dream time. They imagine this, this continuity, and it's amazing. And then each newborn person, has, it has to be decided who each newborn is descended from in that dream time. So you have perpetuity of the, of the group. It's an enormous idea. You see its utility for any kind of collective uh, bond. And it's especially useful for race. They have a genetics, a folk genetics, because they need to, uh, to be able to say something about the origin of a child. And they do that by ritual, the very important question, as origin is, is important to us, and we deploy genetics to do it. But it's done by ritual, it's done, because that continuity over time is important. He said without a, a concept like that to hold it in your head, the perpetuity of groups could not be accounted for. Now, I have more trouble with the continuity of individual personhood because I have, I'm not capable of doubting the continuity <laughs> of my personhood, but philosophers do it. And Levi Strauss did it. He started referring to Levi Strauss in third person. <laughs> I think there is something in there to make you crazy. But anyway. <laughs> But it's, I suppose it's not, it's, it's not obvious. It, it has to be done. And I know from my reading that Durkheim would never have been doubted, uh, had any doubt about that, because he was reared as a Jew in an observant household, and every morning he said a prayer called the Modé that thanked God for returning his soul that more, uh, after the night's sleep. So year after year, you do that. Soul doesn't look like, appear to be anything distinct from you. But you know it's inside you. It's not, it's not the same as you. But you see where, they, where I'm going. It's an enormous achievement to be able to do that. Now I asked my daughter, who's in biology, if uh, animal societies can recognize person, individualhood over time, and apparently 
the pack animals can, that's what she told me. But humans have to do it symbolically. They have to do it with notions like soul. And um, I don't know yet uh, how they think animals who do that, who, who recognize individuals do that. Now, the idea of personhood, I said it was ancient. Uh, I think that Durkheim, I know that Durkheim took his formulation of it from Plato. Um, and uh, which says, which characterizes soul as rational, indissoluble, always identical to itself, the same in all its parts, one big extension of same and, um, and that's what it does. Identical in its parts means that in the case of the, the marauding uh, mobs in the South, for example, any black person would do. And uh, the uh, same in all its parts means, now I can't apply that to my case, but I can certainly tell you in terms of relics, any part of a sainted body will do. There are magical principles that apply to things like soul, which we have to keep saying, are, they're invisible, they're not material, they're witchcraft-like, they have the same reality where they are in force, but they are, um, they really, Shall I say they're not real? I can't say they're not real, but you know what I mean. They have a, a reality that's not the same as other, other parts of our life. Witchcraft depends on uh, an invisible realm of entities that are always active. I'll finish my sentence and thank you. Uh, come in. That are always active. And so does racecraft. Okay, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to like to confirm, so you're saying that soul is like the meaning that you're attaching to it, like so your body, and it's just like physical components, but like the soul is like you saying that you're you, or you know, like a per black person in the South is a person in the South, or a saint is a saint, because like the soul is the attachment you're giving them, is that? No, the soul is something that's there for every individual. It's, it's, it's a tough one. Soul is there for every individual that's living. Um, and I'm saying that in the South where I was talking about it, where soul is understand in its group aspect simultaneously with its individual aspect, any individual will do in certain circumstances. No distinctions to be made, one of them. <coughs> like that. And feel no sense of its being not making any sense. So does everyone have the same soul, or? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Big question. No, everybody doesn't have the same soul, but um, everybody exists in their, uh, I guess in their social realm. Everybody, there is some way of, of formulating the personhood in that kind of every individual in that context. It's not an animal, a person is not an individual animal. <clears throat> Personhood is something that is that evolves in social context. And soul is a way of talking about that personhood and it has the properties. Um, people who get uh, certain kinds of mental disorder lose it and can't do it. But the capacity to do it is enormously useful in, nav uh, in navigating the world. Um, <laughs> um, now, coming closer to uh, race craft, the who and the what. I have moved, gone forward in recent writing to say, to, to say that soul is put forth with those, uh, as Plato and Aristotle put it forth. Um, it's, I call it an identity program. 
that has routines. And in particular societies, you can observe the routines because we still have to stay with soul being done. It's not inherently plausible to say I have a soul that's invisible, immaterial, and nobody else can see it. So to make it real, that prayer in the morning helped. It went and it came. I was in semi-death and I came back. But things like that. Now it has subroutine. There are what I call identity routines. And this, this one, look what you can do with it. The idea of soul enables human beings to impose ideal sameness on material difference so that everybody in this room could have be, a, could have be assigned a name to something and have it erected into something more substantial than our casual meeting now. The identity program um, can also impose ideal difference, that is ideal in the, uh, in the mind difference on what seems to be sameness. The identity program works on what is merely visible, like let's say the real world, loosely, uh, loosely speaking, rather than this humanized world that soul allows us to have. Um, you see plenty of examples of that in elementary forms. But I pointed out recently that those routines can, of course, be captured in the United States, imposing ideal, uh, imposing difference on ideal sameness and sameness, ideal sameness on actual difference. Um, when Walter White, everybody know who Walter F. White was, was the first Negro director of the NAACP. When Walter White, a Negro with blonde hair and blue eyes, infiltrated the Ku Klux Klan to expose lynching, as he did in the 20s, he ran the risk of being lynched for pretending to be a white man. White's Negro identity like the Australian identity of the, can of the kangaroo human I was just talking about, didn't owe its existence to mere appearance. The identity program with the ritual that su supports it handles that. Um, in an amazing <coughs> passage by William Faulkner, which I think I've marked. He makes that point, and uh, Faulkner has the, uh, was a genius in that he's writing literature, but one always has the feeling that his, some of his metaphors walk down the street every day in Mississippi. And so he doesn't invent things that sound as if they're remote from where they arose. Now, here we are where the lynching was carried out against somebody named Joe Christmas in Light in August, the novel Light in August, published in 1930, I think. He was lynched, he was shot, and then he was, uh, he was castrated. He's somebody who was walking around town, people assumed, didn't think he was a nigga, as they said. But, Changes shifted in an eerie way that shot, that um, that Faulkner has that allowed them to say, well, they were, he was going to be, he was really was a nigger. They never found out what it was, but he everybody, but he was there for at least a year, and they, everybody thought assumed he was white. But they realized that the victim of the lynching was black, and here's how Faulkner de described it. When the mob castrated what they called the white nigger, Joe Christmas, quote, the pent black blood seemed to rush out of his pale body like the rush of sparks from a rising rocket. 
Upon that black blast, the man seemed to rise soaring into the townspeople's memory forever and ever. The members of the mob saw and remembered, this is us commenting now, physical evidence. They saw and remembered physical evidence that they could not possibly have, been, have seen. But you know people speak of black blood all the time. Why wouldn't they, and white blood, and Indian blood, and so forth, why wouldn't you see it when in a crisis like that? Or imagine you saw it. And then they agreed their memory uh, coincided. And the chase, there, and then <clears throat> um, their own actions, they remembered more about him and more about him his blood. The black blood, this is quoting Faulkner again, the black blood drove him first to the Negro cabin. And then the white blood drove him out of there. As was the black blood that snatched up the pistol. He was accused of shooting somebody. And the white blood which would not let him fire it. It was the black blood which swept him up beyond, by his own desire, beyond the aid of any man. Swept him up into that ecstasy out of the black jungle where life has already ceased before the heart stops and death is dire, desire and fulfillment. And then the black blood fails him again. We know in Mississippi things of that sort went on. We know from Faulkner how um, people, how, how the metaphors in which it was conducted, the kind of um, thought structure, thought process people had. And uh, that's, uh, that's what we know. We, I wish it wasn't there or so, but it is. Anyway, I want to conclude <coughs> more or less by coming back to Durkheim. I want to open up to Thursday's lecture. Um, <clears throat> Wednesday. It's Wednesday? Yeah, Tuesday and Wednesday, and then Thursday is the same time. The lecture is tomorrow. Oh! And <laughs> so the lecture is tomorrow at 4. The second lecture is tomorrow at 4. Oh! And then Thursday at noon is just an open forum seminar. Oh! I had. Oh, my. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was office hours tomorrow. I thought, I, well, there's usually, that uh, we should have uh, announced well, this as look, well. There, there usually is a kind of informal office hours just for people who want to individually meet with you and talk about your I work. see, I see. But the second, the routine for lectures are Tuesday and Wednesday at 4 o'clock. I see, okay. And then Thursday. Okay, I'm glad you told me. Well, that seems like a useful, um, useful bit of information. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, I want to point toward Wednesdays tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Um, where I'm going to be talking a lot about rituals that concern blood, but uh, in a way that brings me back to race craft in America, in that um, it, it was in, in that we have known in the United States that since the beginning of the 20th century that black blood and white blood and racial blood don't exist. Blood exists in certain types because blood has work to do of its own, having to do with getting oxygen to and from, uh, to, to and from the parts of the body that require it, trans require it, transporting food. But that the immune system rejects alien blood. Now, the tribe, the, the Klansmen, and the people in Virginia, uh, I'm sorry, in Mississippi, um, have a theory of blood that says it's a, it's a nasty, it's an impossible connection. Um, it's, it's impossible. The blood, there's one blood to a group, and it's impossible to even imagine a natural blood that doesn't care, that's not oriented to race. You with me? <coughs> hmm? Okay. 
It doesn't care. It has its proteins. It does its thing. But those people in Mississippi, when this was discovered, would have, would have had a terrible problem with it. Someone says, we have the blood you need for your transfusion from a Negro donor. I know for a fact, because I've seen it on the page, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have blood from a Negro donor. I wouldn't have a relative of mine. I'd rather see them go to eternity than have blood from somebody like that. So we have a classification of blood that belongs to nature and that we know increasing amounts about. And we have a classification of blood that belongs to society. And those, it has classifications too. Nature is indifferent to them. But it's hard to convince people even now that that's the case. Before we were able to wind up uh, racecraft, I received at home a, this is a shocker, I received at home a circular letter that uh, went to students at the Atlanta University Center, which is, which is a uh, historically black uh, set of colleges and universities asking students to, I hope I have the quotation, um, yes, <coughs> African American donors provide the best chance of survival, this is the Red Cross, for patients of color with rare blood types, or those who must have repeated transfusions for sickle cell anemia, heart disease, kidney disease, or trauma. Blood from a donor with a similar ethnic background to that of the patient is less likely to be rejected or cause complications or illness. Now I would expect somebody of the Klansmen to think complications and death or illness. But this is Red Cross in the year 2010. So I shot off a letter to say, where is your science? On what have you based that? It quickly came back. Here is the science. And it was a 1990 paper. My daughter said, then it's not dishonest because it's 2010. If they're putting that around, that's bad news. And it proceeded to show the ill consequences of racially unmatched blood for the health of, trans of transfusion patients. Um, I circulated that to people I knew scientifically trained to say, has there, is there more science on, to base, for that to be based on? And they said, you nailed What's wrong with that? And um, I went back. I went. I bet, went back to read what the papers are and what the state is. And this is uh, when you have soul in this situation. Invariant, very interesting things happen in the framing of the scientific, supposedly scientific things. Imagine the same in all its parts. No moving parts. No, no, no moving, no, the antigens aren't, aren't con considered, uh, at least in the formulation. So strange things go on in those papers, and which I was able to identify, I think, in a recent paper, as the concept of soul having transited into <coughs> a certain kind of medical research. <coughs> and I'm going to say more about that. It belongs to the realm of ethnography, right? The same as the making of, of kangaroo nests and, and the consecrating of, of blood, totemic blood. So I'll be saying more about that in the session about ethnography. Thank you. So the floor is open for discussion. We have till 5.30 and then um, just to remind everyone, tomorrow is the second in the two lecture series. Both today's lecture and tomorrow's lecture will be posted on the Hayden Center website. So if you can't come to tomorrow's lecture but are interested in the open free, freewheeling discussion, which is a, on Thursday, you can listen to tomorrow's lecture later in the evening with, once it's posted.
So, but now the, the floor is open. I'll, I'll relieve you of having to keep track. I'll keep okay, my, I'll sit down now. my eyes open. So, and then I'm first. Vince first. Well, I saw his hand first, so okay. Okay. Grab and, I was very interested in the idea of soul as a collective continuity over time. And if I understood you right, and tell me if I'm wrong or something, but if the, that someone could actually have more than one soul yeah. from a collective point of view, if you feel a strong identification with multiple groups that don't necessarily completely overlap, what are the implications of that? What are some examples of that? Any comments on having more than one collective soul? Meaning being of mixed blood or meaning having been initiated, inducted into different and different communities. I think people manage that. I think, um, well, you know, there's uh, W.B. Du Bois who talked about double consciousness and the, uh, the strangely displaced sense of self that can emerge, but he, he's not talking about soul in the same, he's, it's in the souls of black folk as a matter of fact, but he's not using this platonic concept. He's talking about the feeling of being objectively American and objectively Negro at the same time and um, negotiating a situation where it's impossible to make them one and the same. And so, in his case, it's very beautifully described and poignantly described. It mobilized his life. He was claiming Americanness, which did not have to be incompatible with Afro-Americanness. But there was the ritual that, uh, that said he's a Negro, and it meant that this genius uh, was not able to work at the summit of American higher education as his genius warranted. Um, and as Durkheim's uh, genius warranted for him in the French setup, he got to the pinnacle of French higher education, racism or not. But Du Bois wrote a study of the, um, the ending of the transatlantic slave trade um, that was the first in the famous series of monographs, the Harvard Historical Series, but there was never such, such a thing as that. So we can now, we can, that's on, our, my way of thinking takes it right to on the hook, how you get things done, what things you can do. Where people have multiple languages or potentially multiple personalities, I don't know, I have not, I don't have much insight. Have I answered? Is that? Mm -hmm. yeah, you should, should have called on me first or you forget my question. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, but uh, a very interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, you said soul is that concept that allows us to identify as the same person ourselves when we were a child and when we were an adult. Is that correct? Yeah. Right, and that explains something which I never understood. There was a story about this, uh, and, and then you were talking about whether animals had the same capacity. Yeah. Um, there was this cat, the house was on fire, and the cat had three kittens, and she went back into the house three times to rescue rest her kittens. I don't know if everybody held it, sir. And then they put the cat up for adoption. Everybody wanted to adopt the, the, the cat, and, uh, but they, you know, they say, okay, the cat's up for adoption. So, well, what about the kittens? You want the, the family to stay together? Isn't she going to be disappointed? And they said, that cat doesn't even recognize her children after a while. So, so, so what I think is that your explanation actually explained that if the cat doesn't see those kittens in a continuum, that once they become a certain age, she just, they're, they're, they're apart. Yeah, and that could explain that. But, what you were You'd have to look at the behavior. I don't know much about cats' sociability there. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I have to stop there. And uh, I love talking to scientists because questions come up that are way outside where I am that are germane, and that's one mm -hmm. for sure. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, 
let me uh, say what I thought you said, and you can tell me whether that's what you said. Um, I, I got the impression um, the discussion of soul was really about sacralizing ancestry, and that the connection between race and religion is about <coughs> sacralizing ancestry. When you look at the bagats in the Bible, right? Uh, these are families, uh, these are holy families, right, in the sense that they're part of this tr uh, Christian tradition and have honor as forerunners of Christ or whatever. Right? So um, then, uh, you know, looked at that way, uh, there's then a, a kind of connection between race and religion. Uh, if, um, uh, you know, race stems from this from lineage, you know, from, you know, uh, this kind of a sacred lineage. I mean, is that what you, that's I kinda, what I I kind of like that because that allows me to say, you know, like, well, another thing that I learned by reading every word and thinking about it, there is a second definition of religion Durkheim offers that almost nobody pays attention to. Well, how many have heard that it's about separation of the sacred, of, sacred and profane? That one. All right, a system of ideas regarding beliefs and practices and so forth. But he also says, religion is a system of ideas by which individuals imagine, sur or present, present to the mind, mm -hmm. the society of which they are members, and the obscure yet intimate relations they have with it. Now, their religion is a binding. Of, it seems to me it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a system of ideas that let people have it in their head so that they can keep doing it. That's what I think. And, it's, um, and soul is one of those ideas. But, but what, what, what interests me is how religion and race somehow managed to get, uh, you know, be you know, al alchemically turned back and forth Because with each race other. is, I mean, because race is also a system of ideas by which individuals imagine the society of which they are members and the obscure yet intimate relations they have with it. You know your place and you practice your place. Okay, but, but I mean, for example, you look at the Inquisition where um, you know, so the supposedly the objection to Jews and Moors was, was the theological differences with Christianity. But it became a racial thing when they started talking about cleanliness of the blood and rejecting converts you know, on you know, ra racial, <gasps> racial reasons. Ooh, that's a long, long story. Yes, and that's very, it's, it's very real. And the, 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 after a while, mm -hmm. the, the um, the people who were forced to be converted from Judaism to Christianity were not forgotten in their origin, and for the time it became different. Uh, people remembered it and took them to the Inquisition. It's a very, but the imagery of blood as transporting who you really are yeah. is the the blood that is that the soul. Did I say that Durkheim called soul? Blood, the soul seen from outside. Did I use that? That one. Anybody in here could help me find it. I'd be grateful. I've been looking, looking, looking. Where he got it, and uh, I know he's gotten it from some source because he says it twice. Blood, twice. Blood is the soul seen from outside. Meaning that soul. When you're looking at that blood in that case. You're looking at soul in that case. It just so happens that it's in the form of blood, and they want continuity of it. And your conversion mm -hmm. didn't quite handle it. That, and it's malleable because at the beginning it was acceptable to be converted, and then later the position came it was not. <coughs> yeah, Dave. Could I follow up on the question that this gentleman asked? So, let's say, as a Catholic, mm -hmm. I have a soul. There's a community, maybe some sort of, obviously very strong rituals, whatever. But maybe I have an ethnic soul yeah. that doesn't overlap completely with the, with 
Catholic. How do, I think the question maybe you were getting at that I'm curious about too is how do you reconcile, I mean, do I have two, do I conceive of myself as having two souls? You usually don't have a choice about it. If it's, if it's like that. But these may conflict, right? Yes. In a sense. Yes. That there may be Lutherans in my ethnic, ethnic group that I don't share the same bond with. I can tell you something I learned. I, I uh, learned on a long subway ride in Chicago next to a woman from Bosnia. She said it came to a time where she said she was from a mixed marriage. By mixed marriage, they mean, meant Orthodox and Catholic. And she said there came a time when people of mixed marriages, it was even worse if it was Muslim in one of those, came a time when people said children of mixed marriages are crazy and criminal. The same sort of thing that was the, the dogma in the United States about quote unquote racial mixed marriages. She said they had to, they had to leave. They simply had to leave. And it was bizarre to them. It came from nowhere because they had living, been living on, in a secular communist state for ages. And up came this crap, murderous crap. And so to answer your question, it, we can think of it as individual choice. But people, it's, it's not always, there's not a, always space in which to maneuver. I, um, I'd like to just, I'll jump in and then I'll, um, this reminds me of an, of an anecdote from an experience I had that was uh, one of the most moving experiences of any of my kind of academic trips. I spent a week in Sarajevo, invited by a group of undergraduates to discuss various things, and on the last evening we were drinking and having a very good time, we really made a connection, and I turned to the people I was with and I made the glib comment that, you know, I felt more kindred spirit with them, spirit, more of a sense of shared identity than I did with a fundamentalist Christian neighbor of mine who I could not figure out anything about who they were. You know, they seemed like from a different planet, whereas we shared the same values, the same ideas, we had no trouble communicating. And a young woman turned to me and said, you know, you're, at, you're, you're not understanding what identity is. Identity isn't an answer to the question, who am I? It's an answer to the question, who do others think I am? And if we walked across that bridge, there was a bridge that separated the Bosniak from the Serbian sector of Sarajevo. If we walked across that bridge and you were mugged, the policeman would come to your rescue. If I was mugged, he would sit and watch. And that's why we have different identities. So, you know, that was, that was to me, whoa, now I, and, and then we talked further, and it was basically that as a white male, educated, you know, successful person in the United States, I had the privilege of, of treating identity as something that I chose for myself, mm -hmm. that, that um, was an answer to the question, who, I, who am I? And that in general, in rich countries like the United States, the fact that adolescents are searching for their identity, that itself is a sign of a certain kind of privilege. That she felt that they didn't search for their identity, it was imposed upon them. Um, and I think that bears very much on the mm -hmm. themes you're talking yeah. about. That, um, uh, and just one other just sort of question. There's another term that gets used a lot in social theory, which is essence. You know? And essence is a juxtaposed to appearance. You know, there's that long tradition of talking about essences and appearances of things. Essence, in that sense, does have an affinity to the concept of soul. As Absolutely. Yeah. I call soul in my paper. I'm waiting to see the reaction I keep referring to. I said soul is essentially an essentialist concept. Right. There is no non-essentialist way to express it. That it is, it is, it is, it is. It does its identity um, inherent. Yes? Yeah, well, yes. Uh, I found this just totally fascinating, in part 
because I see both similarities and differences to the kinds of theories of gender that are performative and focused on the questions of structure and ritual and culture making gender out of something that is not per se biologically provided. Uh, yet at the same time, I'm also hearing that in some ways as a contradiction to some of the, the ways in which that theory of gender, the more doing gender performative or structural versions of gender have developed because they tend to emphasize the intersectionality, the, the differentiation as well as the similarity and the ways in, and in a way that's kind of picking up Matt's point about overlap and contradiction, what uh, the making of race through ritual and structure um, and situated action and the making of gender nonetheless have got to overlap. <coughs> have got to overlap in some ways that make certain kinds of structures more invisible or more prominent. And yet it also sounds like the kind of essentializing of soul that you're talking about excludes that kind of intersectionality. No, soul itself has no, has no non-essential aspect. When, when it's doing its thing, there's continuity, there's sameness. That's not perhaps the way everything exists. That's not the way personhood is everywhere now. But that is the way personhood has been and was for a long time. Done with very little room uh, to move. Forward. Even personhood as individuality is a recent thing. Yeah. But, yeah. but at the same time, the construction of gender as something that is very essential to people, that, uh, that idea that people come in male and female in a binary way, and the kind of construction that you're talking about of uh, an essential social race being constructed and experienced. How do those things then intersect? How is it that black femininity is different as well as the same as white femininity? Or how is race experienced both as the same soul? and as different if experienced through the lens of femininity or masculinity or a social position and set of rituals that are organized around gender. Well, there are, you have those. There, I would want to shift to actual ethnography or actual history. I just observe what happens rather than say, <coughs> this is the line along which I think things go. There, at the turn of the century, being a black woman in the United States South was no crystal stair. And I remember I had a, a nasty encounter once at Radcliffe with um, some good ladies who went to do pictures of heroic black women, and they talked, they started to talk about the control under which black women were kept in households in the South, as, even as they became professionals and made things of them, made uh, something of themselves. And I finally blew up. I said, do you know what is involved if you're a black woman in a place where people still believe that every black woman is an open sexual target for them? And you dare? to condemn parents who say, hold it, you know, please, you know, who, con who contain that. The lady likeness, there's a bad side of it, but I know there was a protective side of it. And, uh, and in some places, like Spelman College, where my daughter went, they still do. Because this issue is still there. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that you get to intersect, have your intersectionality where you please, there is a milieu that you had better understand 
and um, know how, as you said, don't cross that that bridge. The green of the bridge is the bridge on the green of. I forget the. Yeah. Problem. Okay. <laughs> don't cross that bridge unless you know what uh, what you're doing because there it is. Um, and don't wear that dress for that man. This is where we got into it. I said, yeah. well. Yeah. I mean, it's just going to be the weirdest thing you've heard. Ever no, heard. I've heard everything. Yeah. Okay, well, these folks. Um, because I can actually see people's cords, and I insist. People's auras. Okay. I insist that that's the soul. So I think that people who, who do see auras, and I've been doing therapeutic touch for, I don't know, what? 30, 35 years, and that uses that energy. Other cultures, other than our culture, know that there's more than three dimensions, that there's a fourth dimension. Many of us can actually see that fourth dimension. I'm, like I said, a practicing lawyer, and I'm a journalist. I just got my master's from the University of Montana. I'm fully functional, and yet, by God, I know what a spirit looks like. And, and I think, I think that the connections between spirits, the energies that we share, could very well be a selection process over thousands and thousands of reincarnations. You know, Buddhists can give you a, a, a list of the different types of spirits that are in people, that are reincarnated. So <coughs> this is not extraordinary. I believe that you're right. I think that people, do choose. They can find the vibrations of these. Um, I've been with people who die, and by gosh, their energy leaves. And so I think when that energy leaves, then they, when they reincarnate, can pick and choose where they go. And I think they recognize the energy, the vibration of each of us. And um, so, so like I say, this is probably most extraordinary thing, but this is just extraordinary in our culture. This is not extraordinary in most of the world. And so, um, I mean, you can find out who's in you if you want to. I've got a story for you then. That okay. sound at least as weird as that. But I don't have a usual experience like that. I was living for a year in Durham, North Carolina. I joined the wine. I went to the pool. In full awareness that once upon a time, there was no such thing as a desegregated Y, y and pool. One day I was at the pool and I saw a woman whose whatever that is, I could feel from the other side of the pool. And she was tall and she was looking at me a certain way and I said, she's trying to decide whether or not a cop acknowledged me or acknowledge me. She's dealing with my presence. I could feel it. So I made a decision just by that. I said, I let, let her get right up. She was walking across the pool because people use it, uh, she was, for, for their joints. It was the warm water pool. So over she came striding and I made it impossible for her to act as if I wasn't there. I said, I'm going to see what happened. And I said, oh, well, you and I, we got the joint problem. I didn't seriously, but I knew she did it. So she talked about her joints a little bit. I could see that she was kind of holding herself stiff still. And uh, so we talked, and then she decided to leave. And she said, this is a great country. And she began to cry like a baby. <laughs> That's my spirit story. <laughs> I think, I think, I, by deciding not, uh, by deciding to come in contact with her by talking, we never got close enough to touch, but we were very definitely close enough in a human sense and in the water too, which has its symbolic aspects. I decided I'm not going to let her just go like that. I saw that look. <coughs> I knew she was scrutinizing. It's the look that says, why are you here? And then it got out of it, and she said, but it's my place, and so she came. 
But she cried, and I suppose she was one of those people who learned as a child that pools are segregated and wasn't quite convinced that anybody like me should be there. And whatever it is that may have happened, is the word disaffected? <laughs> huh? Something came out of her, and she, ha ah, ha ha, and it was like that. She was crying like a child. And then she left, she didn't say another word, she went back. And whenever I saw her again, she didn't, she didn't get close to my <laughs> <laughs> Well, with this interesting, <laughs> 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 it's 5.30, I think we should wrap up the first session. I welcome you all back tomorrow. It's at, in the late room, 8th eight, floor of the uh, Social Science Building. And then again Thursday for the open freewheeling seminar. Thank you very much.